as our, our saying is that clearly you can see already there's racial justice fatigue, right? Which means that people are tired of seeing it in their feeds almost. It's interesting, right? Racial justice fatigue, right? So um, guess what happened at the weekend with football? People are clearly getting racial justice fatigue, right? People getting booed for being on one knee. So how does as youth practitioners future-proof? So when I mean future-proof, the best example I can give it is, is say you, you're decorating your property, this house. This house is called youth work and you've got damp. You can do two things. You can address the damp and, and get it out and knock a few walls through, all right, and get some really good builders in. Or you can paint over it over Christmas. So when everyone comes to visit, you look like you've got a nice clean wall. But what's gonna happen by March? The damp's gonna come through again. And this is where we, so future proofing for us is, well, let's get to the core of this. Let's not, let's start painting over them and let's start really looking at the systemic nature of racism. So let's have a few questions to start off. Um, Windrush, everyone knows what Windrush is. If you don't, it's the, 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 the community, um, the generation that came to the UK after the second world war from the colony of predominantly Jamaica, but also the wider Caribbean came to help rebuild the country after the second world war so my first question and please answer in the chat my first question is what percentage of people from the windrush generation came to the uk with and or a qualification and skill so what came with a qualification and or a skill the answer is depends which report you read by the way is 96 percent right so quite high Second question, out of those who came from the Windrush generation from the Caribbean, what percentage had a criminal record? What percentage had a criminal record? So the highest number we've got is 10%, the lowest number is 2%. And the answer is 0% because you weren't allowed to come to the UK with a criminal record. So a little sub question now, if that's the case, why are some of the youth um, youth offending institutions and prisons that I've worked in, at the 20 that I've worked in, why are some of them 65 to 70% BAME? And I'm very conscious about, the, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the word BAME, but I'm just saying this for semantics because we all understand what BAME means. But as a practitioner, I don't subscribe to that word. But how then, if, the, if there's a beautiful saying that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, why within approximately 50 years have we gone from highly skilled, qualified, communities with no criminal record till the children and grandchildren of those communities um, filling up some of these prisons between 65 and 70 percent. Um, you can type the answer or you can turn on your mic and speak into the room if you want. Okay, so we've got people talking about racism, countries fueled by hate. Okay, interesting, interesting. So people, attitudes, thank you. All right. So the third question then is this beautiful country of 70 million people, um, 70 million people on this island. What percentage are refugees? Type it in the chat, please. What percentage are refugees? Okay, so the highest number we've got is 25%, which would take us to approximately just over 15 million people. And the lowest number here we've got is 1%. So the answer is 0.26%. 0.26%. Now, if you watch the news, you'd be forgiven to think that we're being attacked by refugees in rubber dinghies. Now think about that, right? So once again, perception, right? Reality. So the model that we talk about when we look around people's being, for example, the whole thing around um, grooming. Let's look at grooming as an example. What's the first thing that people, first thing that people are quite often go through with grooming? Someone gets their attention, changes their perception, which affects their reality. Those, that model, likewise, as we see there, somebody's got our attention to think that 10, 15, 25% of the population are refugees. 
Where did we get that information from? Okay, so the last two questions now. The first one is historically in this country, which city has the highest level of knife crime? So historically in the UK, which city had the highest level of knife crime? Okay, so the answer is Glasgow, white working class communities, and I still haven't met a black guy with a Scottish accent yet, which tells us that violence affects all communities. And, it, and um, by the way, I'm not in denial that there are challenges within blame communities around violence. I'm not in, sitting here in denial. What I'm saying is, is that violence affects all communities. So the last one, which will be easy anyway, the last question, what's the biggest challenge facing Muslim youth in the UK aged between 13 and 19? Um, and I'll give you a, because I haven't got, obviously we're not face to face here. So I'll give you a, a little clue, it begins with T and the second letter is E. What's the biggest challenge facing Muslim youth in the UK aged between 13 and 19? First letter is T, second letter um, is E. Quickly type it in the chat, please. Yeah, you're absolutely um, wrong. The answer is not terrorism, it's being a teenager. You see, when you're told something so much you start to believe it, it's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now imagine if there was a youth worker of Muslim heritage or origin in the chat today who felt, you know, they've, they've gone through the whole youth work system as a young person, then thought, you know what, I'm a mate, I'm a, I love it, and I'm going to go on to train to be a youth worker. And they, they, they're on their placement, and their placement has said, oh, you need to go on to this Future Proofing Racial Justice webinar today and take it in as part of your placement. So they come in here as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, really you know, passionate young Muslim person wants to be a youth worker. And then they, they read this and they think, hold on, do, do most of my future colleagues think that I'm going to, I'm, my biggest challenge is being a terrorist? Because the truth is the biggest challenge facing Muslim youth in the UK aged between 13 and 19 is the same challenge facing white working class youth, Somali, Arab youth, um, agnostic youth, LGBT youth, the biggest challenge being 13 to 19 is being 13 to 19. And as youth work practitioners, we have to remind ourselves, and I know it's difficult because we, we, get, we get so much, we get so consumed with so much information, it's sometimes hard to filter. And I'll prove it to you. So put your, pan, put your hand up, please, if you, um, if you have an iPhone. Put your hand up, please, if you've got an iPhone. Okay, excellent. Now put your hand up if you've got an Android phone. Look, there's all the troublemakers there. Look, anti-establishment. Can you see them? Keep an eye on them. Now, can you just show me, if you know, even if you haven't got your phone in your hand, can you just show me how you hold your phone, please, when you're using it? Just show it up at the screen. Hold it up to the screen. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Interesting, because the last time I checked, we used to hold our phones like this. Yeah, every single one of you were like this. And, and don't be smart and say, Ray, I was on, I was on my speakerphone. You see, the generation that we're speaking about today, people, by the time they're my age, and I won't share my age, by the time they're my age, they'll have spent a total of eight years of their life in front of a screen. Eight years of their life in front of a screen. Now, can I, can I share something with you, what happened to me when I was about 15? Hopefully they'll, they'll edit this out. Um, after the session, but can I share something that happened to me when I was 15? All right, so when I was 15, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but when I was 15, we only had three TV channels. And this might go over some of your heads. On some occasions, I was even the aerial. And that really has gone over some of your heads. It's an age thing. What do I mean? Well, what, what are you getting at, Ray? Well, let's put it this way. Even if you were bullied, it would finish at three o'clock. On the weekend, you wouldn't see that bully till Monday. If it was a six week holidays or Christmas, you wouldn't see them till weeks later. The generation that we're talking about today, this future proofing racial justice, there's no let up in terms of con consuming information. So why, why did George Floyd go viral this year? Remember, there's been many situations of that same scenario has happened time and time again. But what was different about this year? 
Does anyone want to mic up or type it in the chat? What was different about this year? Ruben said camera phones, interesting, social media. Okay. Anyone else? Why? What? There you go. Thank you, Megan. The truth is, yeah, and, and Ruben says the straw that broke the camel's back, but that, that, straw, that bale of straw, okay, interesting. Thank you. Neil put it right. Everyone's kind of got it right, but the truth is everybody was at home. There was no school runs. There were no travel commuting into work, right? We all got dodgy hairstyles and big beards, some of us, and mustaches, right? Um, it wasn't leaving our feed, no matter where you turned. That image stayed in everybody's psyche and it didn't go away. And that's what happens with oppression because oppression is not sustainable. History tells us that. History tells us that, but what does it mean? Well, if it's not sustainable, what happens? You reach what's called a tipping point, right? A tipping point. What's a tipping point? Well, a tipping point is something that happens that changes history, changes the game, changes our perception forever. And whether it be anything, whether it be civil rights, whether it be youth violence, whether it be extremism, whether it be the environment, whether it be LGBT, every social impact scenario has a tipping point. And in this modern age, we've reached a tipping point. We've reached a tipping point to the extent that PG Tips will put out a press statement We've reached a tipping point where footballers will be on bended knee. We've reached a tipping point where my white colleagues are saying, Ray, this has given me the opportunity to speak up. Because even me as a white practitioner, I've found it difficult to speak up in white spaces when I see prejudice. Now think about that. So it's an opportunity for all of us where whatever your background is, whatever your background is, who believe in equality to speak up, but not only speak up, create change. But one of the other reasons why I believe there's men momentum is because there's a generation of young people coming up from all colors, all genders, all faiths that aren't having it, cannot process and in their minds that way, I'm gonna hate somebody because they're different from me. So I'm going to persecute, hate, oppress someone because they're different from me. Because they've grown, in a, grown up in a world where they can speak to someone in Alaska right now from their bedroom. Their information, yeah, there's a lot of corrupt information that comes through, but there's also their intersectionality of being young people is a lot closer than mine were and some of you were. So now... What's one of the most important things that we do? Well, one of the most important things that we do is that we continue momentum. In terms of our work, we speak to what, 20,000 plus young people a year around different issues, train over a thousand young people, practitioners, sorry, a year, how to engage with young people, because there's nothing new under the sun, actually. And when it comes to whether, whether it be equality, reducing youth violence, racial justice, the environment. I believe, and I'm not just saying this, I believe there is no other sector more suited to respond to this work than youth work. Even though it's the sector that's taken some of the biggest hits in terms of cuts and closures, who mobilized the quickest in COVID? After the NHS, who were the second? Who were the ones advocating on behalf of young people, right? 
So this is so important, but what's more important or as important is that we continue momentum. Now, if we go back to the icebreaker at the start, some people were off with their statistics and that doesn't mean that you're racist. And that doesn't mean that you're not about equality. What it means about it is you've got to ask yourself, well, who's giving you that information? Okay, so what I'd like you all to do is turn your mics on, please, and read this out as fast as you can. Turn your mics on, have a go. Go ahead. If you can read this. Sounds like a cult in here. <laughs> it could be in the right place. <laughs> the rest could be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself. It's a word as a whole. Amazing. Uh, yeah, and I always thought spelling was important. Excellent. Phenomenal. So how did you do that? Anyone? Who did it? You read it because your brain recognises like shapes and parts of words rather than full words. And your brain is an amazing thing that doesn't need every letter of a word to know what that word's meant to say. Because Kerry, you're like, absolutely right, but you're wrong. Teachers can read what young children write without them knowing what it said. It's how dyslexic brains work artistic brains work yeah okay well, you don't need all the information there and you can piece together things okay you're right from a, for a from a neurodiversity perspective you're definitely right however you're wrong oh i could read you can read it because you can see it megan you are right but you are wrong we see we're evidence-based practitioners youth workers see i need to hear words like cerebrum neocortex limbic system or is that a bit too heavy for a tuesday morning what am I getting at? Well, the thing is that even though we might be passionate about racial justice, what does evidence-based practice look like? And we can't lose sight of that. What works? One of the first thing that works is that we create safe spaces, right? We create safe spaces. How do we create safe spaces? How many of you have created safe spaces in your youth spaces to discuss race? Okay, and set it up and facilitate it because there are very few spaces left. But there's also a lot of the time people, a lot of the time people become like this model. So they look at their, their concern versus their influence. And they think, well, look what's happening in the world. I can't do anything. And, and this concern versus influence model is in our relationships, our salaries, our waistlines, the planet. But guess what? We've, we've got a clear example. Um, remind me of the young lady, Greta Thunberg, right? And look at that example. Now, whether you think that she's been politically kind of nudged and whatever, let's, let's look at it as a model. Think about that. At the moment, the, the, the dynamic for the most part is adults advocating on behalf of young people. Look what happened when you see a young person advocating on behalf of young people. Now, remember, we're starting off with a little board, then we're starting off with 10,000 people marching every month, and then we're starting, then next thing, someone speaking at the UN. And this is why it's so important that we co-produce racial justice with our young people. Because you can see an example. Now, if you go back, and once again, sorry to be that old man in the room, but I remember growing up and seeing people in rubber dinghies pulling up next to oil tankers and desperately trying to paint green piece on the side of an oil tanker. And they were getting hosed down and things thrown at them. And people were calling them tree huggers and saying, get away from our boats, you wear sandals and socks. And apologies if any of you wear sandals and socks. But they were mocked. Now put your hand up in the room if you've got a recycling bin in your front or back garden. There you go. So they were right. But all those years ago, they were mocked. And I believe as it, as it, as it relates to racial justice, 
We're in the rubber dinghy next to the oil tankard. We really are. We, people have got, we've got people's attention, but the truth is, and let me be, let me, let me be honest what the black community is saying, even though you may have heard it yourself, they're saying, yeah, bended, being on bended knee is good. And a couple of press releases is good. And yeah, okay, the odd brown face on the board is okay, but that's not where the change is gonna come. The change is gonna come if we, 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 we set up our organizations, our programs with an equality lens, with an equality lens. So let me, let me put it in perspective. People talk often talk about anti-racism, but still in their policies, they don't talk about anti-blackness, which are two different things. If you look at the LGBT community, for example, their needs are not monolithic. Their needs are not monolithic, right? Likewise, around anti-racism, the needs of people of color is not, is not monolithic. So what am I getting at? Well, let's put it in, I was working in Manchester recently, white working class community. However, the children were the children of Eastern European communities. But those children have grown up in Manchester, born in Manchester, grown up in Manchester, but have Eastern European surnames. And they say to me, right, I catch hell at school because I'm not, because of Brexit. They're white, they're born in Manchester, yet they're still seen as, do you understand where I'm going with this? Now that's racism, that's anti, that's racism, but it's not anti-blackness. And if you look at the statistics, and if you look at some of the, the challenges, and you look at some of the, the, the even within communities, BAME communities, there's serious issues around anti-blackness within BAME communities. Okay. But what people aren't talking about is, well, how far can that go? But before we, we look at that, we got to, this is this is the model that we have to look at. How do whether we've got a one full-time youth worker and one two sessional youth worker situation, or we've got 20 staff, 30, 40 staff, what is our influence? What is our influence? Because our influence is what we should focus on, not the concern. What is our influence? What can you do today? How do you continue momentum? How can we make sure we're not just painting over damp as it comes to racial justice? Because we know where this can go. We can see what's happening. Yes, everybody being at home and seeing George Floyd, it, it, it definitely triggered some conscience in, in the world, but it also triggered other behavior. And when people talk about systemic, it's interesting because it's, it's, the, it's that word, isn't it? It's that word that's not going away. But the best way, if you look at um, a few months ago, we had the situation at Burnley with the Man City were playing at Burnley and they were on the bended knee scenario and the plane went over with the banner on it. That for me is the best example of systemic racism. Why? Somebody booked the plane. Somebody designed the banner. Somebody flew the plane. Somebody put petrol in the plane, right? Somebody signed it off. At one point in that whole process, someone didn't say, you sure that's a good idea? Actually, on top of that, someone also got air clearance. Because you can't just fly around the city with no air clearance, you know that, right? And that's all throughout that whole process, nobody said, this might not be a good idea. So you have universal buying. So when we talk about how far it can go, well, we know how extreme it can go. We know how extreme it can go. We know how, let, we know how far hate can go. Hate at, hate at its very worst, whether it be ideological, whether it be far right, 
whether it be religious inspired, warped ideology, that's how far it can go. It can go so far, it can make someone turn up at a mosque on a Friday and kill tens and tens of people as they're about to pray. It can make someone strap a suicide vest to themselves and go into a children's concert, not the other side of the world, no more than probably a hundred miles from where everyone is logging in today in a children's concert. That's the extent that hate can lead to. And let's remind ourselves about this. This, you know, when we when we when we watch the um, when we watched the, the Anton Ferdinand documentary the other night, if you haven't watched it, take a look at it. You know, what we saw there was a, an interesting dynamic because it was the first time he revealed that he wasn't the one who took John Terry to court. And then they played, if you haven't seen it, please watch it. Then they played some of the audio when he was being interviewed by the FA. So as the person who was, who was called a black, you know what, he said when he was in his interview, he felt like he was on trial. But when he heard the audio of John Terry's interview, there was a lot of banter, a lot of jokes. So when we talk about systemic change, we've got to talk, look up, talk about it in different areas. We've got to talk about it in different areas. Thank you, Ruben. Um, someone might post a link. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause and we're going to show a short film. The short film is about 13 minutes, but it's an interesting film. And it, there's, just, there's just one task in there. I want you as a youth practitioner to identify the stereotypes. Okay? You as a youth practitioner to identify the stereotypes. Okay, so... We'll leave you, I'm gonna um, turn your mics off and um, we'll come back to the presentation after. Thank you. The city's so heartless here. Does anyone have the heart to care? You want therapy, come sit inside my barber chair Cause you don't know what I'm facing All this hating And I wonder what the future holds for little Nathan I don't think I can go. He'll survive. You need to get away from here before... And Donatello, make up the team with one other fellow, Raphael. He's the leader of the group, transformed from the normal and nuclear gloop. Pizza's the food, that's sure to please. These ninjas are into pepperoni and cheese, turtle power. That's enough. Do you have to wind up like that? Can't all be Mr. Perfect.
That's what he's saying. This deal's in two days, you know. So? So you owe me. I owe you. And my brother's doing five years for you. His wages keeps your dad in curry. Nah, that ain't my responsibility. I think it is. Look, bro. I know how important family is. If I eat, you eat. This is food here for you. Nah, I'm not in it. Your brother always said you knew the road. Prove him right. When's the deal? I said no. You what? How do you think you're going to get out of here? Your music? Listen, it ain't even about the music. I've been offered a place in uni. Uni? Uni's full of rich kids? It won't last five minutes, man. But at least I get the chance to find out, innit? You got 21 days. Dad, what's going on? You just gonna sit there and let this happen to us? Yes, bro. Tonight, come to the base. And give up the day job. My boys only sweep up for me. Nobody up. I just come to tell you that I can't make it tonight. Why not? Because I've got better things to do, that's why. Better things? You were looking forward to it? My little open mic night thing don't mean nothing to me, you know. <laughs> no, I know how much this means to you. Come on, talk to me. I know you'll do it for me. Look at you. Do you even care about him? Your son who needs you. Your son who's carrying you. Nobody's carrying me. Don't you turn your back on me. He's about to give up on his music. University, his future. And you don't even business, do you? And he still loves you. I love him. I do. I care. If that's true, you know where he'll be.
Yes, cousin. In reach. You have to admit, though, this is better than some crappy community fundraiser. Well, you know something, cause I, I ain't doing it. Come out. Ish, ish, go, go, go. Yeah, come on then. No, not me. This is you. This is your chance. I ain't doing this on my own. No, you are. Go on, boy, make the exchange, come back in. That's no, such no, simple. No, 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 I ain't doing this on my own. You earn your stripes. You earn your stripes. <laughs> to breakout rooms um, straight away. Just to spend a couple of minutes just to share um, some of the standout stereotypes for you in that film. And there were some because I produced it, so I did it on purpose. So um, you should be allocated breakout rooms any second, which means you should start disappearing off my screen. And I'll join you in there as well. Welcome back, everyone. 
Can we have your mics on, please? Hello. Hello, welcome back. Okay, so um, for those of you who were able to see the film, cool. If you weren't, um, it's going to be posted in the chat and you can watch it back in your own time. Um, but for those of you who were able, what, what were the standout stereotypes for you in that film? You unmute your mic. Yeah. Um, we talked about the, um, you often see sort of stereotypes like absent fathers and single parent families. Um, so obviously Nathan's father was, was there um, he was part of a single parent family, but his father was not really present in the parenting as well. Um, and that sort of alcohol dependence is another kind of stereotype that we often see. Excellent. But also, why wasn't he present? Even though he was physically present, why wasn't he emotional present? What was the trigger? The, I'm assuming the grief, the um, the sort of loss of his wife yeah. um, and there's i think an element there in that sort of don't get me even started on the patriarchy because i'll talk all day but like the way that we socialize men and particularly men of color to um to deal with emotions or to not deal with emotions and that sort of toxic masculinity arm of things thank you ruben so yeah interesting um the role that the father was in the house but he wasn't present um anyway any other stereotypes Um, we said about being put off going to uni like his his friend was like basically telling him not to go and that it wasn't for him okay thank you yeah there was another one there was standout one i'll give you a clue the black guy didn't die in this movie so you know we've all watched the samuel l jackson films where he goes in the first 10 minutes eaten by a big snake right never to be seen for the rest of the movie. And also the role of the person who was the main drug dealer. Um, and there were so many, and the reason, not obviously, as I mentioned, I produced the film, but one of the reasons why we often, when we look at films and the media, as it projects the black experience or the BAME experience, is quite often biopic, right? As Ruben mentioned, this kind of like, you know, the black man won't have share his emotions or the black father and, and some of the things, the deeper dives into that, but also how are we, when I say we, obviously I'm, my father's, um, my father's from the Caribbean, but my mother's white Irish. Now I know I don't look like a McSweeney, right? So what's interesting when I'm in a room um, and people are having a bit of banter about Irish people, who's the last person do you think is Irish in the room? I love that one when that happens, I must admit, right? Yeah, but because when you challenge it, it does get people, you know, starting to glaze over. But the point is, is that it's interesting to see prejudices, but there are prejudices that are in plain sight that are going unchallenged. There's racism that's in plain sight that's going unchallenged. And when, so when we talk about racism, you cannot have a conversation about racism without talking about power. Okay, so let's let's set up this scenario here. Who's that person there? For anyone who knows, who's that? Tim Westwood. Okay, Tim Westwood. I knew you were an ex-raver there. I could tell, right? So Tim Westwood. Now Tim Westwood is sixty-one years old. Dad was a bishop, from what we know, private school educated, and week in week out he has these spaces and these channels and where. You know, there's a whole conversation whether a 61 year old man should be having a trap channel, but that's another workshop on another day. Where are his children or nieces or nephews running around in the studio? And on top of that, who gets the payment from YouTube for the views? And sometimes when we look at the equality lens, well, people might say, but right, he gives the he gives a platform to the young people, right? And um, it's an interesting theory. He gives a platform to the young people to spit those bars and, you know, create their art. Well, we're talking about CVE. And remember where you heard this word first, child violence exploitation. How about then if we replace him 
with a South Asian Pakistani man with a beard from Tower Hamlets or Bengali man and have all white working class lads in balaclavas from the Isle of Dogs? Do you think we would see it a lot easier then? The exploitation would be having more conversations about, well, that looks like grooming to us. That looks like risky behavior to us. And here, this is, the, this is the thing, but it doesn't just stop there. In recent times, Puma were launching their new clothing line, House of Hustle. Now imagine this, imagine you've left, you've taken a secondment from youth work, you've left your current role, you go and work for a marketing company in, in, in London, you know, one of those real funky ones who they, their whole business is built around marketing to young people. And, you know, you can picture it, you know, the exposed brick, Apple Macs everywhere, standing desks, Edison light bulbs, you know, these bougie creative spaces and you get a parcel. This parcel um, is, is addressed to you and it invites you to the launch of Puma's new clothing line. So new Puma, new, Puma's new clothing line is called House of Hustle. If you look, look at the parcel that they sent with a trap phone in it. And you're invited to this private viewing of their new clothing line. If you look at the top right hand corner, when you get there, as you're getting served your canapes and wine, you've noticed that Puma have dressed up the whole venue like a crack house. There's the mattresses, there's the graffiti on the wall. You can see it there, right? And the train that never fails to arrive, they've commissioned the local black lads from the flats. And you and I know that they're not spitting about global warming. And the, 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 the thing about racial justice is this, so many people in plain sight are reinforcing stereotypes and they're going unchecked. Now you and I know this as youth practitioners, if we, if, if we, we could find some great places for Puma to invest their money around youth programs, and we will put that logo all over the building on every t-shirt. So this is what happens, but it's easier to exploit to communities when they don't have a voice when they're not around the tables. Now, you think about your organization now, unless you kind of run your own organization, but think about your organization now. Can you just tweet on behalf of your organization? Very few people can. There's a comms team if you're big enough, or you have to, you know, a couple of tiers of management sometimes. My question to you is, who signed that off as a good idea? Imagine the team meeting behind that. Remember back to I said about the plane, the banner, the pilot, the air clearance. Who think about the team meeting where someone turned up and said, "I've got an idea. We will we will design a crack house. You know, like a crack house where these young people are disappearing by the hundred every month on county lines. We'll design a crack house and we'll set that up like the fashion show. And while we we'll invite some industry." Um, buds and some make it all bougie but then we'll, oh, we'll commission that those drill artists who will spit about we call it poverty porn in my work you know black rage and pain now who signed that off as a good idea what lens were they looking through and you could argue that it was just a money lens so it's not just about the overt racism it's not just about, you know, the, the, the person screaming out obscenities and racist language. It, it's deeper than that. When, 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 when we see people like Stormzy doing great work for Grenfell and paying for people's bursaries to go to university, he does great community work, great social impact work, no doubt about it. But when I watch, when I watch Stormzy at Glastonbury, and I see tens of thousands of people screaming out nigger lyrics for 90 minutes, it doesn't sit well with me. Because you'd never see someone on stage screaming out homophobic lyrics, anti-Semitic lyrics. So how does nigger get a pass on the BBC? How does he get a pass? Who signs it off? Like, yeah, that can work. Just for 90 minutes. It doesn't matter if you say it to someone out on the street. But on stage, head stage, Saturday night, 
because the majority of the audience aren't from where Storms is from. And I, someone could easily say, yeah, but Ray, I've heard black people say it to each other and you are right. And someone might say, yeah, but it's just a term of endearment, Ray. It doesn't matter if Drake says it, if Stormzy says it. The fact is, is it appropriate? Should it be allowed? And as I mentioned, I'm children of the Windrun. I'm from that generation. In my culture, as a black male, I've never heard any of my family members use the word. So can I say the B word, yeah? We're all adults here, Brexit. I'm allowed to say it, yeah? Okay. Once again, things are changing. COVID changes all over, cuts. We, you know, we're all going through, everyone's in the trenches at different degrees. Some trenches are bigger than other trenches, but the truth is while all this is happening, there's a little thing, a little B word called Brexit. And do you love, to, does anyone, put your hand up if you love tomatoes. <laughs> okay. Well, for those who are not blessed enough to love tomatoes, but, but was it about 70% of our tomatoes come from Europe? So what does that tell us? It tells us that prices are going to change. There's going to be challenges economically. And his, what does history tell us? Not the NYA, not Ray Douglas, not Kev, not the team. What does history tell us? In austerity, hate increases. Hate increases in austerity. So we've got to ask yourself, where are we? And some of you probably seen this chart, but if not, it's important that we revisit it. Where are we as an individual, as a team, as an organization, as a community, as a household? Where are we? Well, let's look at the zones. So the first zone is what I deny racism. I avoid hard questions, strive to be comfortable, talk to other um, I talk to others who look and think like me. That's the fear zone. The second zone is this is where all of us are, I believe, for the most part, as youth practitioners. I don't know many overt racist youth practitioners, if I'm honest. But I recognize racism is a present and curriculum pro and current problem. I seek out questions that make me uncomfortable. I believe that's partly why people signed up for today's session. I understand my own privilege in ignoring racism. I educate myself about race and structural racism. I'm vulnerable about my own biases and knowledge gaps. I listen to others and who think and look differently than me. And the growth zone, and this is where, you know, we have a, and, and, and this is where we have the opportunity to work with the generation and the young people that we work with. I identify I may be unknowing benefit from racism. I promote an advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist. Some of the work that we're doing with the NYA at the moment is around, um, you may have seen it, equal equity around people of color having equity in the youth sector. Yeah, equality is one thing, but equity is another thing. I speak out when I see racism in the action. Now, this is in the board. This is at the dinner table over Christmas, <laughs> right? This is in the queue. You know, we can all speak out on Zooms all day long, but that's a comfort zone. I educate my peers how racism harms our profession. I don't let mistakes deter me from being better. And this is an interesting conversation. Um, me and Kev have had one briefly about it, other team, other people, about the, the conversation about white allies. You know, I don't write history, but history tells me in the civil rights era, there were tens, hundreds, thousands of white activists who spoke out, who educated others. But, and this thing about, I don't let mistakes deter me from, yeah, mistakes, you know, someone shouldn't get thrown under the bus for making a mistake. And, and, and people might not, there's no, none of my, none of my black colleagues subscribe to the unconscious bias narrative, even though that's the training that's rolled out because we have to be very careful that unconscious bias is a place where people hide some bias is really conscious. I yield positions of power to those who are otherwise marginalized. That's a difficult one for any human relinquishing power. I surround myself with others who think and look different than me. That's a choice. However, some of the other things are clear ways that we can all grow. So 
there's two types of people. I'm going to leave it with this. Um, th we've all seen the logo. But the two types of people, there's those who can see the arrow in between the E and the X, and there's those who can't. And once you see it, you can't stop looking at it. You probably go on Google Images later and show someone at home it and show off. And that's all it's about. Once we see the inequality, once we see the injustice, then it's a lot easier for us to challenge it. And it just means that sometimes we have to just turn our lens slowly and just focus on our influence because we all have some influence.